Hey church, welcome to Camp Sunday. This is HYC 2022. Take a look. church this morning. Uh, as you can probably hear, it's been a week uh, in my voice. Princeton campus, man, we're so excited that you guys get to get a little bit of a window into uh, youth camp this week. And if you're joining us for the first time, it might be a little bit different. Uh, if you call this place home, I know your heart is expectant and exciting. And as one of my friends, Sue Palmer says, today is the day you wear waterproof mascara when you come to church because we just have a special Sunday. Uh, we got some baptisms happening and yeah, it's gonna be great. Um, we've had a week of camp. We've had 100 students, uh, over 50, I think 55, 60 volunteers all throughout the week and it has been incredibly fun, uh, but it's been amazing seeing the Holy Spirit do a work in young people's lives. And so this morning, we're gonna give you a window into a little bit of what worship is. So it'll be a little bit different than a normal Sunday if you're visiting. Uh, students, you can come up and we're gonna fill the front and we're gonna worship just as passionately as we have been all week. And I will say, um, if, if you do need today, the volumes, we talked to our team, is it, it, if it's just a little bit much, we would love to provide, we got some earplugs. Uh, we don't want you to miss out. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna try and keep it to a level uh, that's gonna be great. We're just so excited. Um, I get, this is my favorite service of, of camp because I know what I love is some of you that are in the red seats today. <laughs> You've been praying for moments like this. If you're watching online, new to our church, we have a rich heritage of just believing in the next generation. And it has been amazing seeing these young people respond to the call of God. And so I just want to thank, I know there's been dozens of you 
texting me all week praying for our students. Can I say thank you for your prayers? The Holy Spirit's been moving. Um, if you were a volunteer this week in any way at camp, can you just quickly stand up? I'd love to say, I know lots aren't here, some are serving. Come on, students. Students, just say thank you. None of this happens without 60 plus volunteers. Come on. We love you guys. And if you are a small group leader, small group leaders, this is my first year actually getting to be a hub leader. I had no idea how expensive it was. Um, <laughs> but if you're a hub leader, can you just stand? And students, I want you to say thank you to your hub leader, your small group leaders. Come on. You guys are champions, you're heroes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and there's two people, actually there's four people, first do this. Uh, Pastor Craig and Shannon, can you guys stand? Um, yeah. Come on, yeah. Every one of these Sundays, I'm remembered, I remember a Monday morning Starbucks that I had with Pastor Craig in 2014, where he said, hey, what would you say about moving to Surrey and begin to build a church that will reach the next generation? And everything we do here is because our lead pastors, Pastor Shanda, Pastor Craig, have a heart and a passion for the next generation. As you see, he's not afraid to smack them around when they need it. <laughs> Thank you guys for having a vision for the next generation. Thank you for loving young people. Thank you for believing in young people and making space we love you guys so much. Come on. Eliza, you thank you for our lead pastors. Come on, come on. Hey, 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 hey. Come on. Or as Pastor Mike said a few, a few weeks ago, for our Africans out there, I'm getting better at it. And lastly, I'd love to invite up uh, Alex and Caleb. This year, uh, was a bit of a switch as we kind of grow in different things in youth. And Alex and Caleb carried the, the load of leading, planning, leading our leaders, our volunteers of camp. Camp would not happen this year without these two. Come on. Come on, stand to your feet. Uh, someone asked me this year, so was, it, what do you like think being a battalion leader versus I said, being a battalion leader, your, your muscles are tired. Leading camp, your bones are tired. <laughs> and you guys have carried this so well. Watching you guys do it together has just been beautifully fun for me. And thank you for your heart for young people. Thank you for the late nights, the early mornings, leading our team. You guys are champions. Love you so much. And so, Pastor Alex, take it away. Yeah, I just want to say again, thank you, church, so much um, for the people that have prayed for us. We just covet your prayers. God did a deep work and has set us up fantastically for the rest of our year. Where God, um, Our theme verse was out of James 4, where it talks about drawing close to God and He will draw near to you. And that happened. Our students were so open-handed. And now we have the ability to build and to go out in a way that wasn't possible before camp. Because there are students, as we left tonight, they said, send me. We've had over a hundred students at camp and they want to be sent out into this world. So thank you for your part in that. And this morning, I would encourage you to join into camp. It's not just for the students, it's for you too. Just because the students might jump a little more or sing really loud because they don't care if they have a voice tomorrow <laughs> doesn't mean that that same God is not still working in you. God always has more. He always has more. So this morning, would you stand to your feet? Um, 
students, and it, even if you're not a student, you guys can come to the front. That's what we've been doing it all week. I invite you to come up. We've been doing it all week in church. I would invite you to do it with us, just holding your hands in front of you as a posture of surrender, as a posture of openness. And say, God, even this Sunday, this Sunday, would you come and move? Lord, we ask and we expect that you will move in worship, that you will move in the service, God, that you are not finished with Horizons in Surrey yet. You are not finished with Surrey. You're not finished with this country of Canada yet. And God, we say yes and amen to the plans and the purposes that you have for all of these students, for this church, from the youngest to the oldest, Jesus. In your holy and your mighty name, amen. Amen, let's worship together. Come on, we'll start off fast, guys. Let's clap your hands, come on. Staring to your eyes makes my heart come alive. Suddenly brought to life when I met you. Sing reaching, come on. Reaching beyond the skies. Running deep, stretching wide Perfect love realized here with you Let's sing it out! This love is for real, you will never let go, never let go It's more than just words left beyond our control, out of control
performance Lord, I praise, worship Empty words I can't afford I'm not chasing feelings That's not why I'm singing You're the reason for my song Just my soul's attention All I have is what I need More than a song that lasts a moment I live a life of honest worship If I'm here to sing, then I sing with purpose All the praise Lord you Father, we welcome you today. We thank you that you are good, that you have been good, and that you will always be good. Father, this next song is our cry for our generation, for your church. God, Lord, send revival. Not only in our city, not only in our nation, but God, even in our hearts. This is our prayer. So, Father, we trust whole lives to you. Sing this. Peace like a river wash over me. Immerse me in waters as deep as the sea. tonight let's sing it out as I worship your majesty I worship your name Jesus my
wide the gates Flood every heart with mercy Pour out your presence and have it all praise As we cry holy, holy Open the heavens, fling wide the gates Flood every heart Come on, let's sing it from our hearts Here we are Pour out your presence and have it our praise as we cry. Lord, send it now, move of your 
the Horizon Youth Worship Team. The Horizon Team has written, um, many of them are behind me. Um, it's been our theme for camp out of James 4 and 8. Come near to God and He will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you devil-minded. First song of the sign, the first song, line of the song, God, we set the stage for you. The song talks about drawing close. So I would encourage you this morning, um, whether it's your first time hearing it or for everyone in here, it's your, uh, we've heard it sung it a couple times this week. 
that you would feel and receive the invitation of this song, which is to draw close. Draw close to him, he is closer than a brother. There are things that happen in a moment with Jesus that take us years to work out, that take us years and years to work out that we could never do on our own strength. But as we draw close to Jesus, he restores, he revives, he does more than we can ask, think, or imagine. So won't you sing with us this morning? God reset the stage for you.
We're gonna go back into that bridge and we're gonna celebrate because it's good news. We were once dead in our sin, but because of Jesus, we have new life. None of us would be here if it wasn't for Jesus. And that is something to celebrate. That is something to celebrate. Yesterday we were talking about resurrection life. We have that because we have Jesus in our hearts. We have that because we have the Holy Spirit with us, in us. So we're going to go back into this bridge and we're going to sing this with all our hearts because there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. He's close to us. He's close. He's never left us. In fact, before we were born, before we were born, he knew us by name. I don't know what that means, but that, I don't know what that could mean to you. But to me, it means that I have a heavenly father who is close. I have a friend who is close. When everything is shaking, I know my God is close. When I don't feel it, I know my God is close. When I don't see it, I know my God is close. So we're going to lift our voice. We're going to sing this because this is a celebration. Because God
don't have to have it all together to have you close. Thank you that you see us, that your eyes are searching all over the world for those whose hearts are faithful to you. Thank you that you are close to us on the mountaintop. Yes, God. Thank you that you are right beside us as we walk through valleys yes. that are dark and we don't understand. Yes. Thank you that you are close. You promise that you will never leave us or abandon us. Yes. Though people may abandon us, though we may feel like we're alone, that you have never left us. Never. Yes. And even when we put distance between you and us, you're knock, 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 knocking at the door of our heart. Yes. I want to come and I want to have fellowship and be close to you. You're a pursuer of us. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. For the next 60 seconds, I want to ask you to pray for somebody in your circle that doesn't know Jesus, that right now feels far from God. Can we do that? Can anybody think of When you have a name in your mind, just throw your hand up. Wait another 30 seconds. And we're going to pray all together just as loud as we were singing. Praying for people who don't, all through our city, we have 2.8 million people in greater Vancouver. Millions of people who need Jesus. So if you don't have a name, you can begin to intercede for your neighbor next time. On the count of three, and then we're going to pray out loud, just as loud as we just were singing. Already? One, two, three. remind ourselves you can just stay on that Elena you guys don't run away yet it's good to remind ourselves of what Jesus has done for us and the great privilege it is can someone get me the pulpit up here uh, the great privilege it is to walk with and know Jesus I just need keys so the rest of you can I don't know what Ben's doing but I'm not speaking this morning but I haven't spoken in a pulpit for three and a half months so I'll be careful Because I think it's important to remind us as a church the why of what we do. Daniel touched on it. I'm going to just quickly, uh, Psalm 78 is how God wants his people to think. We have a tendency in our generation to think only of what's good for me and me. What's, what's in it for me, what's good for me, my, God's plan for my life. But I want to just open our hearts a little bit this morning to how God thinks and how God wants his people to think about life. There's lots. Psalm 78 says this, talking about the things of God, the things that we have heard from generation to generation. Some of you have walked with Jesus for 50, 60, 70 years, but you're included this morning. Some of you gave your life to Jesus maybe three days ago at camp. You're included. Psalm 78 says that we will not hide these truths from their descendants. So if, if you're in the room over 30 years old, say, I'm in. There's a lot more of you than that. If you're over 30 years old, say, I'm in. Okay? We will not hide them from their descendants, these truths. We will tell the next generation. If you're under 30 right now, just say, I'm in. There's, I think there's like 100 at least at camp. Let's try that again. If you're under 30, say, I'm in. So, over 30, I'm picking that line for a reason, which I won't get into it right now. We will not hide this from, the, the, from their descendants. We will tell the next generation. That's the under 30s. And it goes on to say this. So the next generation would know these truths about God, even the children yet to be born. They can't say I'm in because we haven't met them yet. But see what God is drawing us to think about? Not just my generation, not even just the next generation, but a generation that hasn't even drawn breath yet. 
that is not even on your heart yet, maybe not even on your mind yet, maybe, who knows? But God is thinking generationally all the time. He's never about one generation. That's why there, there should never be a church that's built on one generation. We, the next generation, a generation yet to be born, and then he goes on further, and they in turn would tell their children. So God is thinking about and calling his people to think about two generations that are not even being thought about by us right now. So when we say, God, would you move in this generation, in this church, we're also thinking and saying, this is not about me. It's about two generations that haven't been touched by the goodness of God right now. And so when we're asking ourselves to remind ourselves of, of God, what have you done in my life? What do you want to do in the lives of those a generation below me? What about two generations beyond? So then suddenly the narrative flips. It's not about me in any way, shape, or form. I'm going to close with this. I don't know if somebody upstairs got this text about a scripture. I hope you can get on the screen. First Chronicles 22 and 5. It's about David. David, he thought he was going to build something for God, the temple. God said, no, you're not going to do it. I want your son to do it. So he, this is his response. And David said, Solomon, my son, is young and inexperienced. I saw about a hundred of them up here, young and inexperienced. What's the response? And the house that is to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent, of fame and glory throughout the land. There's a big vision of a church, and not just our church, but the church of Jesus in our region needs to be about making the name of Jesus magnificent, making his name glorious, making his name famous in the earth. So how does it happen? This is what that generation says, the we generation, the generation above. I will therefore make preparation for it. And so David provided materials and great quantity before his death. In other words, he began to live. He knew it wasn't maybe going to happen through him. But he had a heart and a desire to see God that it would happen maybe in a generation that is beyond me. So I'm going to make preparation. I'm going to lay things aside. I'm going to lay aside. I thought it would be about this and about me. But right now there's a generation coming up that I am determined to invest in so that the kingdom of God, his name would be magnificent in the earth, that he would be great and famous in the world. And David called for his son, young and inexperienced. So young and inexperienced, if that's you, there's a place for you. So what we do in camp, we've done two camps this year, and I'm so proud of you, church. While I was away, I heard that I think it was nearly $8,000, over $8,000 that was given to ensure. If I, yeah. To ensure that kids got to go to camp, whether that was our, I think there's 160 some kids in a younger age group a few weeks ago, about 100 right now. But that's not new to you because you know how important it is to invest in the next generation. That's why in the early 70s we started Pacific Bible College to train up young men and women in the ways of the Lord. That's why in 1978 we started Regent Christian Academy to disciple men and women in the ways of God to make a difference in their generation. That's why we continue to do camps. That's why we have kids ministry. That's why we have youth ministry. That's why we invest in things that are beyond us because the world needs Jesus. The world still needs Jesus. The world needs Jesus. I said this this morning in a huddle time and I was praying this, that the world needs the Jesus that's the chain breaker. The world needs Jesus that's the way maker. The world needs Jesus that's the, the setting of captives free, uh, healing all that are oppressed of the devil. The world needs Jesus. So we're going to be a church like we've always been, investing and making preparation for the young and inexperienced to join with us and together generation after generation after generation after generation to see God's name made great and famous in the world. So we will not hide them from this descent from our descendants. We will tell the next generation so that the next generation would know them. Even the children yet to be born, the ones we can't see yet, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God, would not forget a disease, the decrees, but would keep his commands. 
That's why we do camp. That's why I know, even though some of you are sitting way back there, I miss my spot up here. You're like so good and excited about it because you realize that it's about a generation. You realize it's about reaching a world. It's about 2.8 million people outside of these walls that don't know Jesus, that desperately need the Jesus that you know. What a great privilege it is to stretch for the generations. Young people who stretch, that's ah, not my song. Old people stretching for, ah, that's not the song I would like, that's okay. Because it's about that his name would be great in the world. That a generation after a generation after a generation, his name would be great. It's about Jesus. I was 12 years old at Earl Lakes, full gospel Bible camp, at camp. Literally a sawdust trail with benches under a canopy, tarp canopy in the bush, right beside the lake. There's a 12 year old boy, almost afraid of my own shadow. I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit at camp. It's people, volunteers, I don't even know who they were. I don't know their names, God does. People who labored and struggled to make it happen. And God met me in that day in a powerful, powerful way that literally changed the direction of my life. So do not despise, as Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah said, do not despise the day of small beginnings. When someone at 12 years old, oh, it's all hype or whatever. Don't despise the day of small beginnings and what God might be doing in a young person's life. But just say, God, what, what could you do? I want to put my shoulder to the wheel, whether I'm a younger or an older, and say, God, that your name would be great in the world. He's done it in me. How many of you ever went to camp and saw that you made some decisions there that changed the direction of your life? Just put your hand up. Maybe it might have been 50 years ago. Look around the room. Keep your hand up. People's lives impact and change sitting here because of camp moments like this. We cannot ever underestimate it. So young people, those of you that re were at camp this week, I want you to stand. Stand up. Yeah. And I want you to turn around and look at the people that invested in you. Just begin to thank them. Come on. Come on. Okay. Now, those of you that, no, you, everybody just stay looking at, looking at, it's good to see some eyeballs. We bring the lights up in the back, very, very back too as well. We're at it. Now, those of you that are on that side, looking at these young people, can symbolically, can you just begin to clap for them? I'm cheering you on. Hebrews 11, just in a moment, I'll tell you when. Hebrews, just one, one, one second. One second, one second. I know you're pumped. Hebrews 11 says that there's a cloud of witnesses that are watching things happen, that are absolutely excited about. So we're going to join with heaven, and we're going to just cheer you on for a moment, young people, that you're growing up in, in the middle of a generation that is, there's so many crazy things going on, but know that there's people that are over uh, and above you in age that are absolutely for you. All right? So young people, I, you don't clap. I just want you to hear. And if you want to stand or whatever, those that are on that side of the room, do that. But let's just begin to clap and encourage and strengthen our young people. We honor you. Be seated, everybody. This week we had the privilege of having Ben and Emma Ariannon. I did that because I had to go over his name about three times to get it right. Ariannon. They pastor in uh, three locations Avant Life Church in uh, North Vancouver and Surrey, and as well in Squamish. But they came here to Canada. They're 
They're missionaries from Australia. And God put Canada on their heart. Say, we're going to come and we want to invest our lives into Canada. I know many of you have come to Canada to immigrate here for all kinds of reasons. I believe God sent you here. You might have thought you you won the lottery to get to Canada or you applied or your, your brother sponsored you. I don't know. But know that you're sent here by God. Ben and Emma came with their family and I think a dozen young people that said, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna see some churches planted and I'm, I'm not going to tell all their story. But no, I really believe that as they stand here, some of you have been praying that God would send people to Canada. And Ben, I'm, gonna, I'm receiving you and Emma this morning as an answer to prayers of many, many people. That you're on assignment. I know that you know that, but I want to... I want to say that as well. And and so as Ben comes to share the word, we may go a little over time this morning. Um, if uh, There's food afterwards. So if you're thinking, oh, I got to get home for lunch, we got you. We're going to have some baptisms. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. So everybody, yeah, okay. Turn to somebody beside you and say, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And then turn to the person on the other side and say, it's going to be great. And turn to, the, turn to yourself and say, it's going to be awesome. Can I invite you to just give your strong, warm welcome to Ben as he comes to minister the word. Too kind. What a start to a service, hey? Man, my spirit is blessed to be here. Hey, before I get into it, I just want to give honor where honor is due, and I just want to encourage you, church. You have wonderful pastors in Craig and Shanda. And I know you know they do a lot, but there's a lot of things they do that are unseen. And I can testify for myself and for my wife that over the years, where we've been in hard times or struggling times, we would get a word of encouragement or a prophetic word or a text saying we're praying for you or we had the prayer team praying for you tonight and you could feel the covering of faith into the space. And so guys, can I just say thank you for the honor and the privilege it is to serve here this morning. And serve your young kids over the, do you know what? Camp is both tiring and reviving at the same time. Like, and I wasn't doing anything. I was just tired watching. You know you're in that above 30 category when you're like, that looks hard. (laughs) Everything looks hard at camp. Church, you excited to be here this morning? That's good. That's good. You know, the theme for camp, if you haven't picked up on it yet, was close or becoming closer to God. And I just really want to encourage you, I'm going to share a bit of my testimony this morning. When I say testimony, I mean what God has done in through my wife and my life in the last 10 years, especially the last five, six years we've been here in Canada. But that whole understanding is if you draw near to God, He'll draw near to you. James writes about that in chapter 4, verse 8. Draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. And I don't, I don't know where you've come from or your background or how long you've been saved for. I don't know what your story looks like right now, but what I can tell you is that that we as human beings have a disposition, when we read things like that, we instantly think of benefit, right? We think of, wow, that sounds good because it will benefit us. It will bless us. Who here wants to be blessed? I want to be blessed. I want to be blessed. And so today, I want to just walk us through what it means when we draw near to God and he draw near to us, what actually takes place and what happens. Is that good? Yep. Well, let me pray. Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to come around your word. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would illuminate all that you want us to see and be left with, Lord God, that you continue to transform us from the inside out. We ask for hearts to be challenged this morning and minds to be set free. Have your way, Holy Spirit. We pray this in the powerful, unshakable name of Jesus. And every good-looking Christian said, Amen. Amen. Oh, that's a good-looking church. Hey, I am super blessed to be married to a wonderful wife who unfortunately couldn't be here this morning. She was going to be, but one of our speakers in one of our campuses 
uh, wasn't able to do it, so she had the privilege of stepping in there. Um, we have three beautiful kids. Levi is our oldest. He's turning 12 soon. He's followed by Alice, who's about to turn 10. And then Eden, Knight, Daddy's Delight, is six years old. All my kids look very different. Our oldest looks like me. He's just brown, dark features, extremely handsome. <laughs> He's a heartbreaker. And, um, and then Alice, she has my like brown eyes and darker hair, but she got her mother's skin complexion. A little bit bronzed. I did a little bit of work, but she's a good mix, right? Actually, we're on a boat back from Barnabas Landing, and she was with a bunch of friends, and they were all taking turns at the back of the boat to tell her how beautiful she was. And I said to Emma, this is, this is weird. We've got to fix this. And then we got the youngest one. She is ash blonde hair, blue eyes, white porcelain skin, does not look like me at all, except she has my forehead. Um, and so I always encourage her, hey, look, baby, you'll know that you're mine when you're in a street fight and you need to use that forehead. You just, <laughs> you just throw that thing around. I gotta tell you a story before we get in because my kids are wonderful and they'll give you insight into the dynamics of my family. Uh, about a year ago, our pet cat died. Uh, his name was Kronk. And uh, I know, funny name. And uh, what happened was the night before we found out he was dead, I was looking out, we have a whole bunch of windows that face the street and I was looking out and it was about 9.30 at night, Kronk was not in the house, but there was a police chase on the road that we were living on. And it's not a, it's not a safe road to have a police chase on, but there was one. And I just remember this car flying by, but then slightly braking, then taking off, and then this police car going past. So that's a weird thing. That was weird. Went to bed. I wake up at about 6.30 a.m. to my son rushing into my room. Tears on, he's just crying. He loves pets. He comes in and he looks at me and he's like, Kronk is dead. Like a Time magazine cover. Kronk is dead. And he's just distraught. And Emma comes in. She's like, I've got to take him to football, soccer, and... I was like, okay, so I come out and they've left Kronk in a blanket on a chair outside. And he was hit by a car, right? And I think I know which car. I think it was the police chase car, okay? I look at this cat. I'm sad for my kids. I hate cats, so I was like... Hmm. <laughs> but as a parent, I was sad for my kids, right? So I was like, oh, that's so sad. And so I just left it there and I sat on the couch and I'm trying to think about how I'm going to tell the two girls who haven't woken up yet about the cat because they love the cat too. So I'm sitting there thinking, slightly dozing off. I get up, go to the office in the, room, in the side of our house and I come back and everything looks normal. I sit down, but all of a sudden Alice, my middle daughter, walks in and she's holding Crunk. She's holding the cat. And she's like, Dad, I think... I think Something's wrong with Kronk. I think he might have eaten something bad. And I didn't know what to do. So I just told her what Levi had told me. <laughs> Alice, Kronk is dead. I could have done it better, I know. We learn all the time. And so I, I'm like, <laughs> her face, right? Once a kid realized they're holding a dead animal, they're just like, oh. And I'm like, give Kronk to daddy. So I put... Kronk back outside and Alice is destroyed and so she runs into my room and she's crying. I go into the kitchen, I'm like, I better get the girls breakfast ready and whilst I'm getting breakfast ready, Eden gets up but I don't, I don't notice her either. All I hear is my, my Eden, I call her my Eden, she's daddy's girl, she's like a lamenter. If she gets in trouble, if she doesn't like you, she'll sing a song, like, like a psalm almost. So I hear this. Kronk, why aren't you moving? <laughs> Something's wrong, Kronk. <laughs> so I go out, I'm like, Eden, Kronk is dead. <laughs> Six-year-old, she's not even six at the time, right? She's five, she's like... <laughs> so she keeps singing this lament, we're going to miss you, Kronk. <laughs> Our... Um, my, my assistant who's here this morning, she sometimes looks after the kids and she roused on Eden one time and Eden went to her room and was singing, you don't even live here. <laughs> 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 and so 
I'm like, Emma comes back, Levi's back, we're like, we've got to bury the cat. All right, so I dig a hole, I bring the cat out, and Levi's like, I don't want to, this is going to explain my kids and how different they are. He's like, I don't want to, Dad, I don't want to bury the cat, I just want to hold. I'm like, no, Levi, we've got to bury the cat. It's the last act of love is to bury the cat out of respect. You know, I'm sort of like making it up because I'm like, it's a cat, it could decompose anyway. So I'm like, <laughs> we've got to bury the cat, Levi, it's out of respect. So he's like, I don't want to do it, Dad. He's like, I can't, Dad, I can't, Daddy. I'm like, come on, bud, we've got to do this. Alice pipes up, this is my daughter, very matter of fact. She's like, well, why don't we bury every animal that dies, Dad? <laughs> Alice, we don't own every animal. Plenty of animals. We see it dead squirrels all the time. You want us to bury all the animals? Alice, stop. <laughs> Levi runs off. So Alice is like still talking to Emma. Like, Mom, I don't understand why. Who cares? It's just like we should go bury every cat now or bury every animal. Levi comes back with a mango seed and he's decided that he wants to grow a mango tree on the dead cat. And like... <laughs> This is helping him mourn. And while this is all happening, Eden has gone and grabbed a pile of dirt and she's standing over Kronk and his grave. And she's lifted it up and she's slowly pouring it <laughs> while singing a lament. <laughs> we will miss you, Kronk. It's 2021. Kronk is dead. Time magazine cover of the year. That's my family. I'm so blessed to have them. We've been on a crazy journey. Back in 2015, God told us to leave Australia and come to the North Shore of Vancouver to plant a church. We didn't know anybody. We had no idea. Honestly, Australians don't think about Canada much because you are everything opposite to us. You're cold. Not as people, I just meant in weather. You're very loving people. It's very wet here, right? It's dark a lot more, <laughs> like everything opposite. Like you think about Australia, it's the sunburnt land. We have droughts and beautiful beaches. It's just different. And so we, didn't, we don't grow up thinking about Canada. So when, when God was like, I want you to move to Canada, first I was like, thank you, Lord, you didn't send me to Montreal. <laughs> yeah, am I right? You all agree. Someone's like, I love it. <laughs> we, anyway. The reason I tell you this is because when we talk about drawing close to God, when we talk about coming close to God, something powerful happens. And it's undeniable, and this is what happens. He begins to speak to us. And the closer we get to Him, the more we understand what He is saying to us. We told the kids and the youth uh, this week that when we draw near to God, when we become closer to Jesus, the outcome is we become more like Jesus. Right? It's undeniable. You can't be saying, hey, I'm, getting, I'm drawing close to God, but living a life completely ignorant to his sanctification. That doesn't make sense. When we draw close to him, we become more like him. And when we become more like him, we become more effective for the kingdom. We'd be at, we're able to hear him clearer. The year that Emma and I got married, we got married young. She was 21, I was 22. Um, I just remember like the week after we met up with one of the pastors from our church, and he just said to us, he's like, I feel like God's got a prophetic word for you guys. And this is your word. He, he wants you to hold on to it. If you build my house, I'll build yours. That's what God was saying to us. Ben and Emma, if you build my house, I'll build yours. And, and we've just held on to that. And it's, 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 it was one of those words that when someone shares it with you, it instantly deposits in your heart and there's a witness there. And you know that you know that you know that God has given you something. And when you draw near to him, he begins to speak to things that he's already spoken into your life. He keeps those messages, those conversations going. And through the course of our ministry, when things get tough and things get hard, and we are tempted to try to take control back, God would just remind us, if you build my house, I'll build yours. If you build my house, I'll build yours. And there were so many opportunities just to take control and live a life that we would determine the outcome. But every time, because we remain close to him, because he's allowed to speak into our life, because the hope is we're becoming more like him, those words begin to echo through time. And then 2015 came, and in 2016, and we had to tell people, we had to begin to unravel our life so that we could be sent to Canada and it's phenomenal if you think about this. Like, we knew nobody. 
What I find interesting is that at this time of our life, we had just, it had been about seven, eight years, we had paid off all our debt, and we would just saved enough money for a house deposit, right? And that's a big thing for a young couple. And I just remember, when God's like, I want you to move to Canada. We did the math, right? You try to do the math, you sell everything. You're like, wow, we're going to actually have to use our house deposit money to be able to fund what God's asked us to do. And I just remember there's a struggle there. But what words did I hear in the struggle? If you build my house, I'll build yours. If you build my house, I'll build yours. I want to be blessed, and I really do think everyone here wants to be blessed. But I also think that we've got to understand that the blessing of God is a conduit to this world. We're a vessel to this world. The Bible can be just like divided in my mind in two ways, the Old Testament and the New Testament, but then it can also be divided Genesis 1 to 11 and then Genesis 12 to the rest. Fall of humanity and, it's, and, and the fullness of that fall and the beginning of redemption, which starts with the promise and conversation between God and Abram. I just want to read that, that conversation that took place thousands of years ago, and then we're just going to quickly discuss this and see what the Holy Spirit does. Is that Okay. If you've got your Bibles, would you turn with me to Genesis 12, verse 1. It says this. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, your father's household, to the land I will show you. I'll make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I'll make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. This is the really important part. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Will be blessed through you. The promise of a blessing, the promise of greatness was so that the world would experience God's goodness. The world would experience God's goodness. One of the greatest illusions you can ever invest your life into is the belief that life is meant to be perfect. It's not meant to be perfect. Perfect house, perfect family, perfect job, perfect kids. We know that one's a joke. You know what I'm talking about? Perfect marriage, perfect everything, perfect angle. Yeah, fellas, right? You know what I'm saying? About? Right angle? I don't see your double chin. We want everything to be perfect, and in the church world, we then sell this as the topic of blessing. But when you look at the concept of blessing, it was never meant to be hoarded, never meant to be stored up simply for yourself. It was to be poured out, consistently poured out. The church is a vessel of blessing. We have the message of salvation, redemption, and beyond that, resurrection power. So the blessing and the promise that God gives Abraham that we see in Genesis 12 wasn't simply so that Abraham would have a good time. Actually, we're going to look at this and we're going to realize that it's not as easy as we think. We see in Genesis 15, God actually gives him the idea of the promised land. He gives him the covenant of the promised land. And do you know where God says, I'm going to send you? We don't talk about this a lot, and we're going to go a real quick history lesson. You ready? God tells Abram that I'm going to send you to a place right in the middle where three continents connect. It's the only place in the world that three continents come together. I'm going to position your nation, my nation, in what we call the Mesopotamian Crescent or the Fertile Crescent. This is a parchment of land that stretches through Syria, Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, Israel, and Egypt. Why this is important, if you were going to march your massive army to conquer any part of those, those continents, you had to go through the promised land. Why? Because the only way you could sustain your horses and your troops and your slaves was by feeding them. And the only way you could feed them if the land was fertile. So we hear this, I'm going to give you a promised land. But what we forget is where God's actually sending Abraham is the most contentious and contended parchment of land the earth has ever seen. 
for a whole bunch of reasons, ideological reasons, geographical reasons, uh, reasons, cultural reasons. This is why God puts him here. I'm going to place you there. Every major military force that has come through North Africa or Europe or the Middle East occupied that parchment of land. You had to. No ifs, no buts. Maybe you're thinking this morning when God says, I'm going to give you a promised land, that it was going to be just milk and honey. <laughs> Wasn't going to be big walls, giants, and marching armies in and through, empires coming in and through. But he says, I'm going to make you great. And so the question here for us is greatness simply comfort and control? Or is greatness opportunity and influence? You draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. And God will whisper. Can I tell you, revival starts with a whisper. We want the rushing wind, but it comes with a simple wait. Go here, be patient, call upon my name. And it's not easy, it's not easy places he sends us. He sends us to highly contested areas. Why? Because He's putting his people of power and influence for his kingdom. It's a beautiful thought, actually. We see in, in Numbers 13, uh, you know, we see Joshua is commanded, it, you know, finally go into the promised land. There's a whole story about this, right? And we're talking 100 years, years after Abraham. Like, whole story about this. We're going into, finally, Israel's going into the promised land. What does he do? He sends 12 spies. Ten of them come back with a negative report, two come with a positive report. And what I find really interesting is that the Bible tells us that Joshua commands them to bring back the food, the fruit that's in season. And he brings, they bring back grapes that are so big, they need to carry it on two, a pole between two people. When was the last time you went to a Safeway or a Save-On Food or a Walmart and you needed your buddy to come with you to bring the grapes out? It makes sense because they bring big fruit and the others tell us that there's big people that live there, big giants. The land is wanted and it's occupied and it's defended by big walled cities. Can I tell you right now, when God calls out on your life, when you draw near to him, he's gonna give you a mission. He's gonna give you a purpose in that conversation and it's so that you would be blessed to be a blessing but there's going to be a battle before you. Big fruit, big giants. The promise, if it's big, chances are the enemy's going to send a lot of resistance to stop you from inheriting it. It's a very simple equation, don't you think? We see Jesus turn up in the promise. And he has this conversation, and I think it's, it's interesting because where we might have thought that the promised land was for military thoughts or military might, we know it's for influence. It's for the heart of culture and strength of the kingdom. It's an inconvenient truth, but at the end of the day, after all these years, after all these empires come and gone, Israel's still there. Isn't that interesting? And even they've come and gone several times. It's always influence. It was always opportunity. It was always kingdom. Jesus turns up in this space. We have this saying in our church. It's called create space for faith. When God talks to you, he's going to ask you to create space for faith. I was playing basketball. I know it's a surprise because I look like a basketball player. I don't know. Got invited to go play some pickup, which is funny. Anyway, I had to bring a friend, so I brought our campus pastor from Squamish with me because he's vertically challenged. You don't have to be the fastest person in the race. Just don't be the slowest. That's my mindset. And so I didn't have to be the best basketball player. I just had not to be the worst. So I picked a really short person to come play. Gave myself the height advantage. They split us up and they gave the two basketball players one of us each and we played two on two pickup. And me and my friend wiped the floor of Andreas and Matt. Matt's our campus pastor. 
Like game after game, it was wonderful. But then Andrea started to say something to Matt. And do you know when like you're viewing life, God can really come, the Holy Spirit can come and download into you something, right? And so I'm watching Andrea say to Matt, create space, Matt, so I can pass you the ball. Like position yourself, create space. And while this is ha- like, this is he's coaching him before our next game, God begins to speak to me. He says, Ben, that's how I want my people to live out their faith. Stop praying to me, God, send me. Go until I say stop. It's like a green light faith, not a red light faith. Paul does it. Peter does it. The apostles did it. They just kept going until the Holy Spirit said stop. Create space for faith. What we're actually saying is be proactive and preemptive in your faith. Don't just wait to hear from him. And the reason I say that is because as human beings, we will never let him speak if we take that position. But if we position ourselves, he can pass us the ball. He can put us in the game. We can play our part. We can be effective. Jesus turns up. And he has this conversation with the Jewish leaders of the time. Get your Bibles with you. It's John 2, 18 to 20. They're conversing about the concept of the Messiah and who Jesus is. And the Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They reply, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? See, the Jewish leaders didn't have an issue with the destruction time they had an issue with the resurrection time. See, when, when God spoke to Abram until Jesus arrived, we, we have this Israel and their mindset is that God is trying to create an earthly kingdom. He's trying to create a kingdom that looks like the other kingdoms of the world. When Jesus turns up, he challenges that mindset And really what he's saying is, is that God is not building a nation for this side of eternity. He's building a nation for the other side of eternity. A resurrected kingdom. They don't have an issue with how quickly he could destroy a temple. They have an issue how how quickly he could rebuild it. It's the same struggle we have right now when we talk about blessing, right? God, use me. God, send me. I'll go. But then he asks us to do something, and it sounds impossible. And so we challenge it. And we put it through the lens of what we want and what we desire and the comprehension we have and the lens that we created. We as human, we look to you know, material wealth. We look to authority and power and control for fulfillment of dreams, fulfillment of fantasies, a sense of meaning, success, and sadly, even greatness. I want to be used by God. I moved to the other side of the world. We had nothing. We landed, the team airbnb We stayed in a small basement room for weeks, months, Nothing we thought that was going to be easy was easy. And everything we thought was hard, God actually made really easy. Right? The things that we tried to control, we found struggles in. But the things that we released to him were perfect and provided for. I remember before leaving, we'd had a stressful seven years coming up to this, be nonstop. And I said to God, when we land in Canada, can I just have two months off? Just two months of rest? No stress? And I really believe God said yes. He said yes. And then when I landed, my visa didn't come through, so I landed on a tourist visa, which you, you're not meant to do. My lawyer was like, Ben, don't come. I was like, Vivian, I'm already here. It's too late, Vivian. <laughs> Everything was going wrong. We couldn't get a house because we couldn't get a SIN number because we didn't have the right visa. Kids couldn't get enrolled in school, couldn't get vehicles. Like, it's a problem, Right? But we turn up in faith. He called us. He commissioned us. He said, this is the promise. He told us through a couple that if we were to be faithful and obedient, we would inherit the faithfulness of those who had served and given their life for decades. He told us that he wasn't finished yet. These were the words we held on. He said, if you build my house, I'll build yours. We'd given our life savings to get there. For what? To find ourselves week after week 
struggling to get through, wondering if we had actually made the right decision. After two months, my visa came through. My goods that had arrived by ship, they were going to actually be impounded and sold by the government because we didn't have the right visa. I was thinking to myself, what are you going to do with, like, there were pictures of just myself as a kid. It's weird to sell pictures of a chubby brown kid, right? Like, is that even legal? Like, that's what I'm thinking to myself. Dan had boots in there that had Andy written on them. Like, there was important stuff in there. I remember we got our visa, came through, everything was fine. And I just felt like God say, I gave you two months. You wasted it. And the gracious God he is, I felt like he said, that's on you. <laughs> <laughs> Laugh a bit and walk away. That's just my conversation with God. I'm like, yeah, fair enough. I want to be blessed. But the longer I do this journey, I realize that the greatest blessing is to be the conduit in which God pours his blessing out. You experience life on a far more transcendent level when you experience God investing into others through your life. We know this. Jesus says that if you try to save your life in your own strength, you will lose it. But if you give me your life, if you lay your life down for me, for my cause, you will gain it. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. These are the promises of Christ himself. But as we draw near to him and as he begins to speak to us, as he begins to commission us, as he gives us a place to go and like it's no longer just a parchment of land in the Middle East, he's called you to your workplace. He's called you to wherever it is in your school or maybe you're in university or maybe you're, you run your own business and you're now at the employer. He's called you to be that promise in the world. And it's going to be tough. Of course it's going to be tough. He wants it to be tough. Why? Because that's where the greatest resistance is. That's where the greatest need is. That's where people are hurting the most. Of course it's going to cost you. Of course there's going to be a sacrifice. But everything that I've laid down, everything I've given, he has matched and given more back. And I'm not talking about financially. I'm talking about, though he has been good to us, I am talking about the fact that I've got to experience a miracle. 16 months after landing, and I'm going to wrap up really quickly. We'd gone through a whole bunch of trials. We were meant to launch 2018 in January. In December 2017, we sensed God say, don't do it. We then had to tell all our churches that had partnered with us that we weren't going to do it. We're going to push it nine months. You take a photo of yourself in North Vancouver and you send it to anyone, it looks like you're on holiday. <laughs> so you tell them you're going to wait another nine months and send them a family photo. They think you're just having a good time. But he told us, don't do it. Wait, I've got something for you. Between January 2018 to September 2018 when we launched, January we fell pregnant. April came around and we lost our child at 20 weeks. The night before we found out we'd lost him, we felt like God had given us a name for him, which he had, being Theo Creed, Theo being gift of God, Creed being guiding principle. And then the next day we find out we've lost him and it was chaos. It, like, it, re it crippled me. It broke my wife. It took us months to recover. If we had launched our church in January, we would not have been able to sustain that season. We would have been casualties. God's so good that he said, wait. But in the waiting, at the same time as losing a child, something else miraculous happened. We were given a property on the North Shore. I kid you not, the day Emma went into hospital to have Theo removed because he was too big to just pass naturally, I was sitting in the Tim Hortons. I'd say goodbye to my wife as she went into the, uh, the operating room. Sitting in Tim Hortons by myself, I get a phone call. On the same day that we, we give our son back to God, I get a phone call saying, you've got a building. The blessing of God is hard. The promise is hard. There's a price. And it, was, it felt like an exchange at the time and it took me a long time to process that with God, trust me. But as a church, 
where we were told we would have to be in high schools for years, we would know their own land, and if you did, it would be rental only, you wouldn't own it all outright, it's impossible. The North Shore is the hardest place to plant a life-giving, spirit-filled church. We got told everything. Within 16 months to 18 months, we were given a property worth $7 million. And then in within two months, we were given just under half a million dollars to renovate it. Why? So that we would continue to be the vessel of blessing to the community, that God would give us a greater capacity to be poured out so he could fill us up with a greater capacity to be poured out. Honestly, he's got a funny sense of humor. He asked me to give my house deposit up in Australia, and then he sends me to the most expensive real estate in the world. If that dream hasn't felt further away, it's today. But am I living the dream? Absolutely. Do you know what happened? A year later, we felt called to Squamish. We started small group meetings, three couples. It was very weird. The day that we launched that meeting, I was literally outside on the street and watched a woman get kidnapped. It was chaos. Like, that's how the Squamish campus started. But we believed and we prayed and and a miracle happened again. I kid you not, we got given a second building. Think about that. Within, Within less than two years, we've been given these buildings. And then COVID struck and we think to yourself, oh, you've got to, you've got to really hold back. But God said, no, within COVID, we had a church here in Surrey approach us and we merged together. And we've seen God begin to do a new work here in Surrey in and through what God had established before. Why greater capacity, greater vessel, a greater blessing? Draw near to me and I draw near to you is not a safe thing. It's not a safe statement. I love what uh, C.S. Lewis writes in, in the Chronicles of Narnia. We know Aslan is a repeta- representation of Christ. You remember that, 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 that sentence? Aslan is not safe, but he is good. Christ is not safe if you want to live a comfortable, meaningless life. But if you want to live a good life, you want to live a fulfilled life, a purpose-driven life, then step into the uncomfortable nature of Christ and be a blessing. Would you stand with me? I ask the worship team to come. But can I encourage you right now? We're going to do a little bit of praying. Draw near to me and I'll draw near to you is not a safe statement. It's not for pretenders. I told this to the youth, it's for contenders. It's for people who want to see a change, who want to see a difference. And what I love about this church, and I've been marveling at it all week, is the rich heritage of this church. The generation upon generation that has poured in to this place and into this city. I love the missional heart of this church, the outreach focus of this church. I was telling my team, I think it's phenomenal that you built a school when you could have built just an auditorium that worshipped your own success. Now, that might be down the track where you need to build an altar. I get that. But I'm saying right now, you have a heritage of being a vessel of blessing to Surrey. And you have not peaked. You have not arrived. You have not plateaued. You have the best to come. A deep heritage. Young people, You are not the future, you are the now. Those who think that your time has come and you're the past, you're not the past, you are the now. That's how a multi-generational church works. Everyone is the now. Everyone are laborers. Everyone is being pushed out into the field to harvest. Everyone plays their part. You're not done. Christians don't retire. Young people, you're not too young. God loves to take your passion and balance it with experience. He likes to take your energy and balance it with a measured nature. That's the tension of the kingdom of God. I love that we serve the Lord of all ages, the ancient of days. He is the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. He is the divider of seas and the crumbler of walls. He is the resurrected King. He's the one that lives and walks and breathes. There's still power in the blood of Jesus. 
And He's done more and more in your life than you could ever imagine, but the best is yet to come. So can we do something right now as a combined generation? Can we pray for Surrey? Can we pray that God's going to do greater things in and through you as a church right now? If you believe with all your heart that the best is yet to come for Horizon Church and that He has a greater calling of influence in the promise of Surrey, would you just raise your hands as I pray right now and join me in faith right now? I told you, Jesus isn't safe, but He is good. The kingdom isn't easy, but it is beneficial and it's powerful. I am unashamed of the gospel. Are you ready? Lift up your voice. If you can pray in the language of heaven, would you just lift up your voice right now? Lord, we thank you, Holy Spirit, for the work that you have accomplished here in this church. Lord God, not just in the last week, but the decades before, Father. Lord, that you have built on faithful people. You've built on generous people. You've built on righteous people, Lord God. Father, that those giants that came before have given us a greater perspective of what is to come. So right now, Holy Spirit, I pray you would pour out upon this congregation greater vision, greater dreams, greater expectation, Lord God. Fill them with greater energy, Lord God. Fill them, Lord God, with greater courage and boldness to bear witness to the city of Surrey and beyond, Father. Lord, pour out your gifts and your spirit, Lord, for you are the good, perfect gift giver, Lord. Father, right now, as hands are raised across the building, Holy Spirit, fall in the house. Fall in your house right now, Lord God. And we claim right now, Lord God, we know as we build your house, you will build ours. As we build your house, Lord, you will raise up ours, Father. Lord God, your word says that if we humble ourselves before you, you will lift us up. So right now, Lord God, we come humble and we say, have your way. Use us, Lord, for the extension of your kingdom. Lord, we pray for revival in the city of Surrey. Lord, but first we pray, would you awaken us? Would you revive us, Lord God? In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Hey, hey. Good. All right, we're gonna do some baptisms now. If those lights in the room, this is an audible call, just bring them full up. The, 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 the little, those little round lights, whatever we call them, hot lights, bring them full up so everybody will be able to see. We're gonna do some baptisms now. So if you're a uh, youth and you're uh, on the baptism list, make your way there, get your small group leader as well. Just go right now. Uh, we're gonna line up. But we have a tradition here as those students make their way. If you're a follower of Jesus and you have never been baptized, baptism is not something you earn. Baptism is just a simple step of obedience. All through the scripture it says, believe and be baptized. So if you've never been baptized, you're a follower of Jesus. Uh, I, we have this thing, we say, we have towels. Everybody say, what's this? We have towels, we have shorts, we do have t-shirts. So this, this is your day. If you've never followed Jesus in the waters of baptism, I just want you to make your way over here and someone will help you. I think Alexandra, right by that door. Be bold and go. Find your way to that. If you've never been baptized, and today is your day. The team getting ready. And if you're a young person, if, or if you're a parent and your young person's getting baptized today, uh, just make your way up here right away. Everybody else, you can be seated. We're going to be able to see it on the screen here. I think I got a list. And this is how, when when someone comes up out of the waters of baptism, very spontaneously, very spontaneously, we're going to erupt in a great cheer at this step of obedience to Jesus. All right, we ready over there? Oh, I'm coming down for this, aren't I? Okay. I'll hold the mic. You're going to... Just say your name. Lauren. Lauren, have you made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life? Yes. You want to follow him for the rest of your life? Yeah. Upon confession of your faith this morning, we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.
come on. All right. Mira, you next. Let's go. Now keep your glasses until you get in. Mom and dad, mom and dad, come on. Yeah, don't worry about this camera. You get your pictures. She does need these to get in. Okay. Mara, have you made Jesus the Savior and Lord of your life? Yes. And you want to follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. Upon confession of your faith today, we now baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.
if if you've never been baptized, maybe you're 30, 40, 50, whatever, and you've uh, never been baptized, you've made Jesus a forgiver and leader of your life. Today's your day. We have t-shirts, we have towels, and we have water. Here we go. gonna die it's okay <laughs> all right well just a sec just get want to tell everyone your name I'm Adam it's Adam Adam do you have you made Jesus a forgiver and leader of your life yes you want to follow him for the rest of your life yes all right on the confession of your faith we baptize you in the name of the Father Son and Holy Spirit into the Lord Jesus Christ yeah
like Pastor Men said, you're laying down your life. here in a moment to bat barbecue. And I just invite you to stand to your feet. Well, well, we were just playing, right? Let's go. Stand to your feet. All over the room, we're going to close out with this.
powerful message. So glad that you could join us and quiet. watch and Let's participate with us quiet. today. If you want to find out any more about Horizon or check out more of what we do and what we have, you can follow us on social media. Give this video a like. Um, check out more of our videos on our YouTube channel. Check out our website. And tune back in next week for our next Sunday live stream. See you later.